I think if you're going to do anything, do it enthusiastically. Not. <laughs> I we while we're in worship, I'm going to be speaking to you out of Zechariah chapter four. But while we're in worship, you should never like do these things. You guys who speak, you should never just like get some sort of inspiration and just. I think I'll read that. You should just go with what you had in the beginning. But I'm not going to do that. I. <laughs> In Zechariah chapter 4, beginning, uh, I guess, this is fine print. <laughs> Somewhere around verse 2, because I think it is. And uh, this is not part of what I'm going to speak on. I just thought, I'm going to read that. This is the angel of the Lord talking to Zechariah. And he woke him up like a man out of a dead sleep. And he said, what do you see? I said, I see, behold, a lampstand, all of gold with a bowl on the top of it and seven lamps on it and seven lips on each of the lamps that are on the top of it. Are you getting blessed by this? <laughs> and there are two olive trees by it and one on the right of the bowl and the other on the left. And I said to the angel who talked with me, what are these? And the angel who talked to me answered and said, do you not know what these are? And I said, no, my Lord, I don't. <laughs> well, then uh, just to say that I'm going to read the rest, which is what I want to talk to you about. But I just thought of the prophetic words and things that uh, I've experienced over my life. And most of them, most of them, all actually, were mostly understood looking back rather than looking forward. And God brings things to pass. And then one day I'll look back and say, oh, that's what that was. Because how can you make sense out of this prophecy? Really? Uh, well, let me read on and then we'll preach. Then he said, well, this is what this is. Now, I find this interpretation amazing in light of what he just saw. He says, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, great mountain, before Zerubbabel? You shall become a plain, and he shall bring forward the top stone amid shouts of grace, grace to it. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house, and the hands shall also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For who ever has despised the day of small things shall rejoice, and shall see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. Now, this scripture takes place at the conclusion of the Babylonian captivity. If you know Babylon come in and they, they totally raised the city and burnt down the temple on the walls and just rubble and blackened wasteland. It was, and carried off people into captivity, Daniel being one of them, kind of the brightest and best they took with them. And, uh, but at the conclusion of that captivity in Babylon, some amazing prophecies began to be fulfilled. Jeremiah had actually prophesied the captivity, but he had also prophesied how long that captivity would last, that it would last for 70 years. Now, Daniel, who's in Babylon, evidently the scroll of Jeremiah had been misplaced or lost somehow, He's reading it, he discovered it, he's reading it, and he realizes, hey, 70 years of captivity that, that Jeremiah prophesied, and he kind of looked on the calendar and figured out the 70 years were like expiring. It's like, hey, it's time to go home. So he sets himself to pray and fast for 21 days that this prophecy would be actually fulfilled. Now, that's an important point. Because as we pray on earth, that which 
heaven directs, his will is released. It's important for us to understand what his will is. God, in his graciousness to us, has determined that his purposes on this earth are actuated by our partnership with him. We know God can do anything he wants to do, but he is determined that we, as his people on earth, that we would partner with him in it. So as we pray on earth, that which heaven directs, God's will is released and actuated here on the earth. We partner with God, and that's why when the disciples said to Jesus, you need to teach us how to pray like you do, and he said, well, when you pray, you pray this way. Your kingdom come and your will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. There's an assumption here that somehow we will connect with God as a self-revelatory God in such a way that we will have some understanding of his purpose on earth and pray back to him, Lord, your will in heaven may be done here on this earth. So as we pray on earth, as heaven directs, his will is released. God has determined that you and I would participate with him in his grand purpose here on the earth. That's a marvelous thing. Well, back to the story. So this man named Zerubbabel was, was the guy who led a contingent of the Israelites back to Jerusalem to begin to rebuild. And the first order of business was to rebuild the temple. Now, another guy would come along and build the walls, but to build this temple because what gave them distinction as a people were that they were a people of God and a people of God's presence, and the temple represented that to them. And it's the same for us. What gives us our unique identity on earth is that we are a people of God in which the presence of God is in the midst of us people. So he's building the temple is the first order of business. And there are key players in this whole drama. There's Daniel and Ezra and Nehemiah, Zerubbabel and the prophets, Zechariah and Haggai. And it seems that Zechariah is prophesying to Zerubbabel and Haggai is prophesying a lot to the people to try to encourage them to have hope, to raise up and to build the house of the Lord. And so Haggai, who's a bit of a, uh, he's a prophet that I can identify with a lot more than Zechariah. He's pretty crusty and down the earth. He's kind of a redneck in a way. And he's telling it as, just like it is. He doesn't have all these fancy uh, candlesticks and things in his prophecy. He's, he's talking to them. He says, you people, you're saying it's not time to build the house of the Lord, but you're finding plenty of time to build your own houses. And so he's a pretty straightforward prophet. So Zerubbabel had been back now about 10 or, well, maybe 12 years to build the temple, and he had had a good start, and he had laid the foundation. But over the process of time, things had bogged down and Zerubbabel and the people got discouraged and they quit showing up. They decided we'll just build our own houses. They lost motivation to build the temple. It can happen over a prolonged period of time when it's hard as you can lose your motivation. Nothing was happening. And so Zerubbabel represents for us Those situations we find ourselves in where it doesn't seem like anything is really happening. And the work is unfinished. And he seems to be unable to lead it forward. He's unable to get it done. And so God comes to him through this prophet Zechariah with these words. Then he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, great mountain before Zerubbabel? You shall become a plain, and he shall bring forward the top stone with shouts of grace, grace to it. So Zerubbabel represents all of us in this room in those areas in which we have frustration by what is not happening, where we've had hopes and dreams of things. And it's gotten hard. And for some of us, it's unfinished territories within our own life. I 
one of the elders in this church who will remain nameless. A few years ago he was talking to me because he had talked to a leader and he had become frustrated. I don't know how anyone can become frustrated with leaders, do you? <laughs> and he, it wasn't you, Brian. <laughs> don't look at him, it wasn't him. He frustrated and he lost control in discussing this issue. And he told me afterwards, he said, I'm not happy with myself. There are people in this room that are not happy with themselves. You may feel inadequate or you may feel incomplete or you may think if people really knew me, maybe you feel inadequate as a father or as a mother. We're all experts with kids when, when they're babies. Somehow we have to grade ourselves down whenever they become teenagers and they're trying to determine their own identity and way because God doesn't have any grandchildren. They have to encounter God for themselves and it can be a real testy time for us and feel like, I don't know that I'm a good father or mother. Or even sometimes you can think, I don't even know if I'm the best person in the world, you know. And then we have these thoughts about Christians, you know, good Christians and bad Christians. I don't know what that is, but I'm not a very good Christian. And we're not meeting what we perceive to be as the standard of what we should be, or the standard that others, we feel others maybe have placed upon us, or the standard we think God would have us to be. But in particular, we don't somehow meet up with the standard of how we think we should be. So, as we dwell on what isn't and what we are not and who hasn't done that, we feel we should be and we become discouraged. It's the opposite of what David did. If you remember the story of David when he came back and all the wives and kids were all gone while they'd been to war and he came back and they'd been taken captive. And at that point, his army was not very loyal. He had no friends. And the Bible says that David encouraged himself in the Lord. And sometimes that's all you have. It's good when others come around you and encourage you, but you do have those moments when they're not there. But he encouraged himself in the Lord. But what we most often do is we discourage ourselves instead. We started with zeal, but like these people, and like Zerubbabel, it's an unfinished issues in our lives. And for some of us, just, just you get tired. It's the weariness of things not changing, or it's the weariness of status quo, or it's the weariness of the same old battles, and you think, is this ever going to change? It's like living in a cul-de-sac. Well, now we're getting popular, we're getting roundabouts with no off-ramps. It's like living in a in a roundabout without an off-ramp. Things are not happening the way you set out to see them happen. And there are promises that you thought you had that are unfulfilled. I wonder how many in this room are living with unfulfilled prophecies. I am. I am. There are words that I do believe to this day are from God but I'm trying not to interpret them. And I'm not even trying to interpret the answer because it may be someday I'll look back and say, oh, that's what God did. That's what he meant by that. But if not, I somehow believe that God's word is eternal and when I go to heaven, they're still in place. That's where I have to live. But you have words not fulfilled. Someone said 10% of the people do 90% of the heavy lifting, and I don't know where they get those statistics, but it seems like it's true sometimes. And people leave the church, and some, and most of the time when people leave and they withdraw, they don't do it nicely. Have you noticed that? They have to justify that. And you can go into a survival mode, and oftentimes we're disappointed with people that we were counting on and 
failing or withdrawing or uh, sin in people that we had high expectations for, or there just seems to be, are you getting discouraged yet? He said, I'm going to bless your socks off. I got to take you low before I can take you high, folks. (laughs) And we aren't at the bottom yet. Well, we can feel, you know, that people have let us down and there's this gravitational pull backwards, drains us of our power to dream and believe and hope deferred makes the heart sick, doesn't it? I thought it would be different. Well, that's what Zerubbabel's seeing. He goes to the work site, to the temple, and he sees the rubble and the irregular silhouette of an incompleted task. And it doesn't seem like it's going to get done. And it creates a a weariness. I'm tired of doing my part. I've tried doing my part. God doesn't seem to be doing his. They've attempted to get it done, but there was... So much that opposed the completion of the work and there was the weariness and the shame and the condemnation. No doubt, he, he's just like us. He may have done exactly what we do. We berate ourselves. We say, well, I could have done better. But, but don't labor under the supposition that because you could do better, that that negates that God isn't going to do anything then. I was thinking on the way in, I was trying to remember exactly what the argument was about, and I don't have any idea, and I'm glad I've forgotten. But years ago, uh, and I was the pastor of a church, not this one, and we had a rather intense fellowship on the way to church, (laughs) which means we were in a heated argument. And... uh, You know, it's just a silly thing to do because you say something that raises the water level, which is retaliated, and it keeps going this way instead of diffusing the situation. And I'm going to be preaching. And uh, I remember at the end there, people coming forward, and this lady came forward, and she said, I want you to pray for me. Well, I didn't have anything to give her. I've been fussing with my wife all the way to this meeting. I didn't feel God at all. I had no spiritual equity at at all. And she had a very serious health issue. She says, I want you to pray for me. I went through the emotions, I did. And she was healed. (laughs) Don't labor under the supposition that because you could have been better or done more that God is somehow negated because of his love for his people. Don't live under that bondage that because you didn't do well, God won't do anything. The, The devastation that comes to us when we somehow become the issue. When we look at our lives and our inability and we see few alternatives, we try harder. I've been there. Try harder. I'm going to do better. God, I won't do that again. I'm going to do better. I'm going to do better. It's a subtle thing because in trying to do better and working harder, I'm subtly moving away from the grace of God into an arena of works. And I never win when I do that. We or others become the issue. It's interesting, the prophet Elijah has always been an inspiration to me. He became the issue, not being well received on Mount Carmel. This was a mighty man of God. How many of you know this this was a dude? This is a guy you want on your team. And uh, when he stood up there and said, let's see who's God. Let's go up there on Mount Carmel. And uh, the God who answers by fire, he's God. And remember how the prophets of Baal were working real hard to try to get some fire and, and, and Elijah was being real crude. He says, where's your God? He's out in the bushes. 
How do I say this? <laughs> defecating. He was defecating. <laughs> He made him mad. He got him riled up. And then he poured water on his, you know, the fire. Now, the, here, was the, here was the shootout. It was, if Baal is God, then follow him. But if God's God, follow him. And, of course, we know what happened in that story. God came and consumed the sacrifice. And then Jezebel said to him, I'm going to kill you. And the guy runs. How can you be that bold and then run? When this woman said, I'm going to kill you, I can tell you why. Because he was laboring under some expectations that, if, that when the fire was consumed, there would be a revival and people would turn to God. Because that's what it was about. If God be God, follow him. If Baal be God, then follow him. But it didn't happen. And the expectation of how it would look and what would happen did not take place. He was not received. And he became the issue, and he ran away. And when God found him in that cave, and he said, what are you doing here? He had a rehearsed speech. He'd said it before. I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty, and the Israelites have rejected your covenant, and they've broken down your altars, and they've killed your prophets, and I'm the only one left, and they want to kill me. Now, when you look at that, he's become the issue. I have. I've been very zealous for the Lord. They're wanting to kill me. And then they've broken down your covenants. So it's the issue was him and the issue was them. It's interesting to me, when God comes to Joshua, and he, what I'm trying to say to you, don't make yourself the issue when things aren't happening, as you think they should. When God comes to Joshua in Joshua chapter 1, and the verses open up something like this. Moses, the servant of the Lord, and Joshua, the servant of Moses, the son of Nun. That's not a very good title. <laughs> and Moses died. And how would you like to have that opening word? The responsibility of leadership comes on Joshua. It says, Moses, the servant of the Lord, is dead. And now you're going to take these people in. And for, I think, nine verses, God talks and Joshua doesn't get a word in edgewise. And he tells him, basically, it's not about you, Joshua. It's about who I am. Be strong. Be courageous. Because I am with you. Don't make yourself the issue. Don't say I'm not Moses. That's the point. Zechariah the prophet comes to Zerubbabel and he has a word of hope. He says, <laughs> he found it in something deeper uh, than human ability or wishful thinking. Zechariah's word is a word of contagious hope and where to find his power and strength is to be accomplished by the application, operation of God's grace in his life and by his Holy Spirit, where John 14 tells us he's a paraclete, he's come alongside with us, God is with us in the person of the Holy Spirit. And it's not going to be accomplished by pulling ourselves up by our own bootstraps, but by an iron grip on God's grace and the power of his Holy Spirit to accomplish what he promises. Zechariah tells him, that the impossible, and it was impossible, is going to be accomplished not by his own human effort and strength, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. I don't understand some of the things that God asks us to do. They seem crazy. He said to Zerubbabel, this is how it's going to happen. You're going to get this done by shouting grace, grace to it. Now, what kind of a strategy is that? <laughs> and I thought about it on the way in, and I thought, isn't it interesting that the strategy for taking Jericho was taking a walk around for seven times and shouting at the walls? 
What kind of a military strategy is that? Or when Jesus handed the box lunch to his disciples and said, why don't you feed these 5,000 people with this little lunch? Now, the only way that makes sense to me is this. God is trying to demonstrate that our dependence for the work being accomplished is directly upon him. And it's not by efforts of our own. Zechariah brings hope and grace that will enable him to steward the hope. So the temple was completed. Zerubbabel received the prophet's word. He brought a divine perspective and focus was changed from himself to God, the God of grace. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And like the prophet Zechariah, I come to tell you tonight that God will accomplish his will in your life regardless of how you look at yourself at this very moment and in the church. And if you're the working of his Holy Spirit and the result of his participation in calling for God's grace causes the work to get accomplished. It's not about what you're not. It's about who he is. And the fact is that he's chosen you. And I put my trust in that. Grace is the ongoing work of God in people and a person instead of our own working efforts. Who are you, great mountain? It's kind of like when David went to face Goliath. Who do you think you are, uncircumcised Philistine? Who are you, mountain? The pile of circumstances that seem to resist our forward advancement. What are you? You shall become a plain. There's something malevolent in that rubble. There's something of a spiritual resistance there. But he's going to bring the top stone and he's going to finish the task. It won't stay this way. Gord MacDonald said, in pain and failure and brokenness, God does his finest work in the lives of people. If that's you, you're a candidate. His success was dependent on an action. He was to shout grace, grace to it. Grace is God's power sent to you. I think we have some statements there on grace. Do you have them? Grace is the ongoing work of God in people on behalf of his purpose. Next one. Grace is the tangible manifestation of divine power on behalf of his purpose and our need. Grace is an act of God's motivating pure love flowing from his throne toward you in a sovereign act of giving. Grace is the directed power of God on your behalf. And when given, it makes all things possible. Grace is the ongoing work of God in exchange of the working of man on his own behalf. Grace is the unconditional acceptance given to an undeserving person by an unobligated giver. Shout grace to it. And grace has direction. It's not indiscriminate. Our extremity is its destination. Grace travels to the arena of our need. Our extremity is its opportunity. When Paul was facing his own personal mountain of weakness, God comes to him. And he says, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is perfected in weakness. And the issue, therefore, is never your weakness. It's always his power. It'll be completed. Ephesians 2 tells us that we are his workmanship. You're created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand 
that you should walk in them. Who are you, great mountain? That which towers over you, that turns you inward, that seems impossible, more and more circumstances piled up against you, rubble, unfinished tasks, the limitations of ourselves, the impossibilities of our own nature. God comes. It's just not going to stay that way. But it comes when your dependence is on him and you shout grace to it. Now, can you imagine the scene here? After he receives this word, the sun's setting, no work's been done, no workers show up, and he looks at the rubble and he remembers the words. Zechariah didn't have an ounce of rebuke for him. Neither does God have that for you tonight. But a promise of accomplished and resources. So you see, shouting grace to something is, is it's standing in our weakness with reliance on God's favor and power, with hope, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. What about the unfinished territories of your life? Weariness, lost heart, that sin that seems to have a hook in you that you've not been able to overcome. Will we call on God's grace tonight and God's ability meets our inability? I have never known what I was doing If you were to ask me how to plan a church, I really don't know how. I never have. I planted churches before they wrote books on how to do it, and I'm glad I did. I only know a couple of things. I pray. I ask people to join me in prayer. We pray with the idea of hearing what God would say. I like prayer meetings where there's prophetic words. I want to hear what God would say. And out of those prayer meetings, God has said some very crazy things. People who are from Jubilee, some of you would know. It was in a prayer meeting that God spoke to us about moving out of a a building we had in Webster. And we didn't have any place to go. And we had a building. But God said he was going to move us. Those words just didn't make sense. And over the process of time, the only thing I know to do is pray, hear God, and do what he says. And every place I've been, it's been different. I don't know how to do anything. I never have. I don't have the ability to do very much. I really never have. Because I'm so aware of the fact that I'm not all that gifted and that I have these weaknesses, it's proven to be an advantage to me because I know I have to depend on God. If I were all dressed up with all kinds of charisma and gifts, I might not depend on God. I might let my personality or giftedness try to carry the day. For all of you who are in this room that are well aware of the fact that you can't get it done and you've tried, for all of you in this room You may feel like, you know, I have these areas in my life. I have these weaknesses in my life. And I'm just not going to get it done. And it doesn't seem to have changed. Can I just tell you, God wants to meet you. That you're in one of the most blessed situations you possibly could be in at this very moment. Because the fact is... God's grace is manifest in your weakness, and that is its direction. And when you are well aware of your weaknesses, your inability, 
those types of things. That is the direction of God's grace that you can invite there into your life and into that situation. And that which is impossible is no longer impossible. So when God says, my grace, it means God, power, God's power is present. It's not tomorrow because you don't need it tomorrow. And it's not yesterday because yesterday has gone. My grace is present tense available for you at this very moment. Power. His power is perfected in weakness. And what that means is your weakness is of no consequence because God makes it redundant. There is no such word as impossible in God's dictionary. And what more shall I say? For time will fail me if I tell you of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Japheth and David and Samuel and the prophets who by faith conquered mountains, conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword. But here's the important statement. From weakness were made strong. These were weak people. They came mighty in war, and they put foreign armies to flight. They started weak, but God's grace, his power, his spirit, made that null and void. Can I just say, you are all candidates for this powerful work of God on your behalf. You trust him. You call upon him. Your limitations serve as only a ground to move into an arena without limit. God, gracious opportunity is your dilemma. Do you get that? Not by power. Not by mind. It's by his spirit, says the Lord. When you read scripture people. They're just like you. They all have their issues. In Acts 4, when the church was told they shouldn't preach anymore in the name of Jesus, and they come and they prayed. And they started out saying, Sovereign God. They quoted scripture. They told God what he did. And then they simply prayed, God, do more of what got us into trouble in the first place. And the Bible says, the place was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Those mountains that stand against you, those things inwardly and outwardly, like those people in that Sanhedrin that said you can't preach anymore in the name of Jesus, those things that try to tell you you can't you can't, you can't, it's wrong, it's wrong. And tonight, we want to pray for each other and we want to invite the Holy Spirit to come. The very thing that we need is the power and refreshing of the Holy Spirit. God's gracious power comes through us through the, he who walks along with us. The Holy Spirit. And if you will receive that, if you will no longer, and you, you don't look inward to make yourself the issue or your situation the issue. If you just turn and say, God, you're the issue. My weakness, my situation is of no consequence when you come to that portion of my life. And then we want to invite him there. Let's stand.